So that's has actually covered that whole, if you think of hadith strength and the strength of hadith in terms of a league table, you'll get sahih at the top, you'll get hasan, you'll get weak, and then at a certain point you'll start getting fabricated. Fabricated is 100% non-factual. So that's the whole um, table of hadith in terms of authenticity. And they all are based around five principles. The five principles of sahih hadith, and actually not just the principles of sahih hadith, they're the way that you decide whether a hadith is sahih, hasan, or da'if, or mawdu. Okay? So those five things are actually things that we did the last lesson, and actually continues on this lesson. The last thing we're going to do is actually look at non-Muslim criticisms of hadith science. And this is going to be interesting because this is based upon something very, very simple. I'll give you a couple of facts and you can tell me what the problem is and why non-Muslim scholars of, of Islam raised a massive question over the authenticity of hadith literature. Imam Ahmed, he's got about 40,000 hadith in his book, Al-Musnad. Okay, he's got a book of hadith and inside that there's about 40,000 hadith. Now he selected those from how many? Three quarters of a million hadith. Now where did those other whatever hadith go? Were they all fabricated? Why did he not put them in his book? The question's obvious. And it's not just Imam Ahmed. Imam Bukhari, in his book, you could, you could whittle it down to about 3,000 narrations or even 2,000 narrations. How many hadith did he go through? It said he went through at least 600,000. Some say 700,000 hadith. Now what proportion is that of what he went through and he knew? Why didn't he include those hadith in his collection? It's a massive, massive question mark. Now what's the problem? And if, you're an, if you weren't a Muslim, you were thinking of that, what would you think? The rest are not reliable, is that a good conclusion? Or the ones he recorded are extremely strong. Anyone else? Repetition. Repetition. That's a good one. Repetition. So repetition could be a reason. But can it account for 700,000 and he takes about 3,000 out of that? He only took them for specific purposes. All right, so he kind of left aside historical stuff and kept. Okay. Now, but the interesting thing is all those answers are actually interesting. The problem is this. Given the number of traditions recorded in, the, in these um, collections of hadith are far less than the amount of hadith that scholars actually knew. They questioned the authenticity of every single hadith that was related. They said if, it, if the majority of hadith, one in a hundred, is worthy of being recorded, it means that 99% of hadith are actually not fit to be recorded. Now if you're thinking of that, in a number of ways it's interesting why they did that. The first thing you would think about is at least they were honest in sifting through all that and trying to find out what was true and what was not. Because we know people fabricated. The interesting thing is they did not, and this is actually mentioned a couple of times by the people that answered, they did not set out to record every single hadith, only a representative selection. That was the most important thing. So if they had, and I'll show you what that means specifically, if they had about 20 hadith on the same topic saying the same thing, they would choose one, which is one hadith, and they would choose that to be the one that they would actually collect. But that's interesting. We're going to look at how that is. The second thing is, those numbers we're talking about, we're talking about, what, 600,000, Imam Bukhari, three quarters of a million for Imam Ahmed. Those numbers mean what? It's important that you know what those numbers mean. What does it mean to have memorized 600,000 hadith? meaning prophetic traditions. It means that there might be one saying there, but that one saying has, say, 20 isnad, 30 isnad. That one saying of the Prophet has 30, 40, 50 different ways through which we've come to know about it. So Imam Bukhari would know the saying, that one saying, and he would know the 40, 50, or 60 chains through which that came to him. Do you understand? And that would count as not one hadith, it would count as how many? 60, 70, whatever it is. In other words, the numbers we talk about are not the saying, it's the saying with this isnat. 
So when Imam al-Bukhari is said to have memorized whatever he's said to have memorized, it means he memorized the text and the chains that went with it. And that's the most important thing. The numbers quoted are not based upon the number of mitten, hadith texts, but rather each chain of narration is classified as a separate hadith. Now we're going to look at something that will show you what that means. This is a hadith, you're going to come and look at this hadith in, in the next module in prayer. The Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever of you prays Jumu'ah, then let them pray four cycles of prayer after it. That's a saying, that's a matin. Now, that's related by Abu Huraira alone. But how is it related? Abu Huraira is on the far left-hand side. And one of his students was Abu Salih. And one of his students was Suhail. And then from him, this hadith came to us in a number of collections. Now you have Ibn Khuzayma here, you have Imam Muslim here, you have Imam Muslim here. Imam Muslim, in fact, relates this hadith about five or six times in his collection, in his book of hadith. That one saying, he relates it uh, at least five or six times. How many hadith are in that chain there? So you have Abu Huraira, released, uh, who, who related it to Abu Saleh, who related it to Abu um, Suhail, who related it to uh, Khalid, Sufyan, Ibn Idris, Ismail. All these people are people that heard the hadith. And then they passed it on to these people, to these people. The last numbers on the far right are the books in which we find the hadith. Now that one saying of the Prophet is counted as how many hadith? Just that one. And that's not all the narrations. That's a representative um, Snapshot of the narrations. How many, how many hadith are there? So basically you look at the end and you count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Twelve. Okay. So when they say that Imam Bukhari had recorded a certain amount of hadith in his book and he knew a certain amount, it doesn't mean he knew a certain amount of sayings. It said, it said that he understood and had memorized a certain number of hadith. 2,200 is said to be the number of texts, sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu that Imam Bukhari has, has selected in his book, specifically prophetic texts. Now, how many um, isnad does he have in that? He has over 10,000 isnad in his book. In other words, there's a massive difference in the number of texts that he has and the number of chains of narration that he has, over 500, 100% increase. But that whole issue, <clears throat> now for Muslims, we understand what that means. That a hadith, when we say, talk about numbers, it means not just the saying, it means the saying plus isnad. So say if I say, so, say one thing to you, okay? If I say something to you here, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it. This first line hears this saying of mine, okay? And then take the next row to be the next train of narration. If you relate it to every single person there, okay? It's about 20, 25 people. That's 25 hadith. It was one hadith to you, that's 25. But say you heard it and they relate it from you as well. You're multiplying. And they relate it to the road behind them. Each person relates to 25. In about three generations, that hadith could, could reach to what amount? You know that story about the, the, the chess game where the person said for each, you'll know this one. It's all about mathematics. He had a game of chess with um, the king and he said, all I want is, if I win the game of chess, I just want you to put one piece of rice on each um, checker and multiply it. And then whatever the result is, multiply it. And just go along the chessboard until you get to the end of the chessboard. And that's all I want for, for winning the game. And do you know how much that is? If you multiply it every single time. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, your brain can't comprehend it. It's like crazy, isn't it? Have you heard of that? It's the same thing. One hadith of the Prophet can, be, can in a couple of generations reach, because Imam, um, in fact, Abu Huraira had over 800, 100 students. And if, if they had also 800 students, how many students is that? How many hadith is that? How many, et cetera, et cetera. Exponentially, you manage to really create a large, large number of hadith. Now, the point of Orientalists was what? They said that early scholars forged chains of transmission 
in support of various um, positions that they had. For example, the hadith that after me Abu Bakr is a rightful Khalifa, for example. Fabricate that and, and you want to actually promote that. Now, if you want to promote that, you have to have a chain of narration. And what he said is that people fabricated the statement, like say, you, I'm not going to say you fabricated I'm just saying like a later generation fabricated it and then they fabricated him. You fabricated him and said he, you, you heard it from him. And then you fabricated him and said he heard it from him. And then you fabricated it to the Prophet and that's how you fabricate a chain of narration. And that's basically what Sakht said. A hadith was fabricated to support a particular claim and an isnad was projected forward. So you basically make up what you want to make up and then you just, you just ascribe the hadith to certain people that you know no one's going to question. So choose a very famous scholar and just say, oh, he said, and I heard it from him, all the way back to the Prophet Now, the problem with that is very, very simple. If it was only one chain of narration, it would be very simple to do that. But if, if you remember the hadith I just looked at, where it had one saying, and then all of a sudden it had 12, 15 different people in different parts of the Muslim world relating the same thing. Now, for them to all have fabricated and not detect it that it's a fabrication would be almost impossible. It's almost like that, you know the film Inception? Where you plant something in somebody's mind and it doesn't happen over one level, it happens over three levels and it has to be synchronized, it's the same thing. And in fact, that, the, his criticism of, had, of hadith science was the most potent and, and at this point in time, in terms of um, Islamic studies and Orientalism, it's been totally discredited because it cannot make sense. People cannot fabricate at a level like that without con actually concluding something that is completely illogical. Now, the reason for this is straightforward. I'll give you an example of one. This is how hadith actually works. If you look at this, remember that hadith I showed you a minute ago with 12? This is usually, hold on, let's go back there. This is, I'm not going to go through this, but this is usually how a hadith works. In terms of not just one narrator, you've got tens, if not hundreds of people relating the same hadith. The majority of those are not recorded because you don't want to keep duplicating things. But basically, you have one saying and you have a number of companions that heard it. If there's one, that's easy. But if you've got 10, 15, 30 companions hearing it, and then the next generation you've got, again, more than that, just think of how many people, how many chains of narration that leads to. The important thing in terms of forgery is that surely they can cross-reference and say this saying it can't be fabricated because somebody in another completely different geographical region is relating the same thing with a completely ch different chain of narration. And basically, in terms of Western Orientalism, that whole thesis of, of fabricating hadith, um, you know, in terms of it being an epidemic is totally discredited now. So in terms of our kind of understanding of hadith, the Prophet Prophet's sayings, his... his his actions, we can be fairly confident that how the traditional uh, hadith scholars classified it is, is a very, very close reflection of what's factual and what's not. So when you read a hadith and it's in Sahih al-Bukhari, you can be very, very confident, whether you're a Muslim or non-Muslim, that the Prophet actually said that. And that comes out of Western academia as well. It's not just Muslims saying that. We are very, very clear that that is a good representation. What it means is something completely different. So what the saying means is something completely different, but the fact that it's said and what it meant is very, very, you know, it's very, very close to being factual, inshallah.